Today we have Jonathan Hilmer, a senior recruiter with Treehouse Foods here to speak with us. Jonathan, I will pass it over to you. Having trouble hearing you, Jonathan. Oh, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, I can hear you now. I have a friend that works in IT and he says, uh, he has a sign in his cube that says, the network is fine, hit the user. So uh, that was an example of that right there for me. Um, so you can see my uh, the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we're not seeing it quite yet. Let me go through and see if I have to do something here. Um, okay. Here we go. Now we're going, right? Yes, there you go. Seeing it now. Awesome. Great, great technology. Got to love it. All right. Well, hey, well, welcome everyone this morning. Very happy to be here with you uh, from Chicago, Illinois. Um, actually, a little bit west. It's a suburb called Oak Brook, Illinois. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Treehouse Foods, which is the company I work for, but I'm going to talk in broad paint strokes too about careers within the food industry. Now, typically we think about, you know, maybe or maybe you think about the food industry at this particular time. You might be thinking about restaurants or QSRs, which we call quick serve restaurants. Quick serve restaurants which um, uh, are one of those situations where, um, you, know, you know, like Burger King or McDonald's or things like that. But that's only one small part of the whole food chain. I mean, the food industry is one of the industries uh, in the United States that is um, that we still house here in the U.S. You know, where other manufacturing has gone global and it's become something that is uh, all across the world. We keep food very close to the United States and for several reasons. I mean, you know, we're looking at one probably right now with this COVID pandemic with these open markets and potential, you know, disease and things that can come out of these open markets in different parts of the world that have food that way. Also, another big part is food standards across the world are not the same. So you might have different things in Europe, Australia, than you do in South America and Africa. So the United States is one of the places, and I'd have to say United States and Canada, that have very, very high food standards. And so manufacturing facilities and just the whole food industry in general has a tendency to stay within our borders. Um, we do have very, very high standards when we import or export product as well. And so we're not gonna get so much into that, but I do want you to know that from a career standpoint, and for uh, what you're thinking about doing is the food industry is very, very US based and very homegrown. And we'll even talk about uh, opportunities there in Pennsylvania as well. So let me tell you first a little bit about my journey and about who I am. So I'm the senior corporate recruiter here. Uh, we have a talent management team, which means that we have people that recruit for our company. So we go out and when we have openings, we go and fill these jobs. So I've been with this company for 12 years. I started with a company called Raw Corp Holdings, uh, which was in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, that was actually an old company called Raw, uh, Ralston Perina. They made pet food and people food. A big company named Nestle bought Perina, so they're called Nestle Perina today, and Raw Corp was the people food and they became Raw Corp Holdings. Uh, we got bought by ConAgra Foods, which is a huge company that knows has you know a lot of their brands, Slim Jim, uh, Oval Redenbacher, um, Banquet, Marie Callender, things along those lines. And then what happened is uh, ConAgra sold us off to uh, Treehouse Foods. So Treehouse Foods and Raw Corp Holdings did the same thing. So number one and two merged within the within the uh, within the industry. So. It's kind of interesting that I've seen a lot of that and survived a lot of that and be happy to talk a little bit more about that at the end about, you know, how your career can really change over the years. Well, talk about career changes. I started out as a school teacher. I taught in the San Francisco Bay Area and here in Chicago. Um, and I taught both uh, seventh and eighth grade as well as high school 
uh, juniors and seniors. So um, I had a career change. Uh, my 20 years in human resource and recruiting uh, happened after I had taught for a while. I've worked in many industries across the world. I've worked uh, in finance. Uh, one, I started out some of my recruiting uh, with MasterCard Worldwide, the credit card company. I've worked in IT and also now in food manufacturing. So learning the different ins and outs of different industries and helping to be flexible is an important part in choosing a career. And just on a personal side, I'm a guitar player, uh, several bands over the years um, and all over the country. And then I also am an avid comic book collector. So let's talk a little bit, who is Treehouse Foods? So we tried, uh, we did a walkthrough of this presentation um, earlier this week and we couldn't get the link that quite worked. So what I'm gonna encourage you to do is to go out to treehousefoods.com afterwards. And if you click on the careers section, there's a couple of videos there. I'm gonna make reference to one now and one a little later. The one here is a, it's a great video about, uh, which actually shows employees that we have that are telling you about why Treehouse Foods is a great place to work. Like most companies, we have headquarters across the country. And Oak Brook, Illinois is uh, where I'm located at. That's outside of Chicago. And then Willowbrook, Wisconsin, which is up by Green Bay. And believe me, our two headquarters have our own problems when we go back and forth because they're Packer fans and we're Bears fans. And there's always a lot of uh, back and forth about that. We also have 35 plant locations across the USA and Canada. Now, I didn't include, but I should have, is that we have two plants also in Italy that manufacture high-end pasta products. Now, in Pennsylvania, we have plants. We have uh, Hanover, Pennsylvania. These are all going to be in the eastern part of the state. Hanover makes pretzels. Um, Womelsdorf makes chocolate candies. So if you've ever seen, like, um, we make, like, uh, peanut butter cups and those little peanut butter cups and then bigger peanut butter cups, we make things like that. Uh, Lancaster, Ohio, uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania makes pretzels and pretzel bites, which I'll show in a few seconds when I uh, show you some of our products, but those infused, you know, those little pretzel bites that are infused with peanut butter. Oh my gosh, I love those. And then uh, Northeast, which is actually a world next to Erie, makes salad dressings and condiments. So you're talking about, uh, when we talk about condiments, we're talking about like mayo, mayonnaise, we're talking about uh, hot sauces, we're talking about barbecue sauces and things along those lines. So a little bit deeper about just food. I don't know if you thought about food manufacturing and you know where our food comes from, but it's really in a big part of our overall life. And you know, since we've been all quarantined in, I don't know about you, but I've gained quite a few pounds just from, from cooking and eating all the time. But food manufacturing in the United States is a huge business, multi-billion, billion dollar business. One of the things that we do that's different than our competitors, and when I talk about the food industry, let's just think for a second about who some of those companies are. So ConAgra Foods, which is a big one, you've probably seen them with Slim Jim, or with, like I mentioned before, Orville Redenbacher, or Banquet, Marie Calendar. They have a whole plethora of products. Kraft Foods. Kraft is a big competitor of ours. You know, macaroni and cheese. Uh, they're Velveeta products. They have all kinds of things that they manufacture. Um, we can talk about General Mills and Kellogg's. General Mills does a lot of baking, a lot of things in the cereal business. Kellogg's obviously known for Tony the Tiger and a lot of their products. Also, Eggo Waffles. So there's a lot of big, major manufacturers out there. And then we didn't even talk about the beverage industry. So you have, you know, you have, well, we call it pop here. So soda pop or pop, um, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, those are huge companies. And then there's also, um, you know, alcohol companies like Anheuser-Busch and InBev and also um, Miller Coors and people along those lines. Those are all very recognizable brands. Now, you also have smaller food manufacturers that you probably didn't even know about. I mean, some of those plants that I mentioned just a few minutes ago, you might not even known exist. 
And so one of the things in the first bullet point on this uh, PowerPoint slide talks about the competitive advantage. And the second one is a point of differentiation. So think about it for a second. I want you just to think about the area where you have stores in your area. So where I live, there is a Mariano's, which is owned by Kroger. We've got a Walmart. We've got an Aldi's. We've got a Jewel, which is a specific uh, store to just to our area. We've got a thing called Pete's Market and Fresh Time. We've got Target. So, I mean, I just named six places I can buy, go within two or three miles of my house to buy food. So how in the world do they get a competitive advantage and how in the world do they make a differentiation between their stores? I mean, if you think about it, they're not, there's nothing different about selling Anheuser-Busch or Budweiser products or Coca-Cola or, um, you know, Slim Jim, those things everyone's buying and selling. So they have to come up with a specific competitive advantage and differentiation in order to survive. I mean, I always go, how in the world do these six or seven places all survive in the same place? Well, one could be a price differentiation. But one of the big things that we do is we are a private brands manufacturer, which I'll talk about store brands in just a second. And in store brands, we are trying to create that point of differentiation for customers so that they can come and people can buy the product that they can only get there or they can only get that price there or we can or, um, or it's a unique product only to that region. So looking across how manufacturing works, you've got the plant in the first step here. You've got then transportation and logistics. To, to, for, first of all, manufacturing and operations. Then transportation and logistics to get it to warehouses. Those warehouses then are, are all different types all over the country that then have to take that food and ship it to the stores. Similar things happen in the food service industry, kind of a similar process. But one of the things about the food service industry compared to like um, retail is that the turns are much faster. I mean, and that makes sense, right? I mean, you have to get that food from the manufacturer uh, here to the warehouse, to the, uh, to the restaurant faster because it'll go bad and spoil otherwise. And the FDA and the federal government is very heavily involved in our business just to make sure that you can stay safe and that these stores and companies um, and restaurants are doing the right thing, um, appropriate things to make sure things are safe. And we'll talk about jobs that are in all of those areas here shortly. So what makes Treehouse Foods different than all those other big companies I mentioned and even smaller ones? So let's talk a little bit about just what we manufacture. So we have two major divisions and we have one called meal preparation and then we have snacks and beverages. So we're manufacturing ready-to-eat cereal, hot cereal, pasta, single-serve mac and cheese. You know, you put a little water in it, heat up in the microwave. Uh, cheese sauces. I mean, if you've ever got went to a place and had that pump where you pump the cheese all over your nachos, that's our cheese. Uh, refrigerated dough. So that would be like, you know, croissants and uh, Cinnabons and biscuits and things like that, competing with the Pillsbury Doughboy. Uh, we're, we're not the Pillsbury Doughboy, we, we compete with them. Pickles and pickle products. We're actually the largest pickle and pickle products manufacturer in North America. Condiments like salad dressings, jellies and jams, sauces, salsa, all of these products. Um, dry blends, which are like, you know, soup packets and bouillons, things that you use in cooking. Coffee creamers, including all the different flavors. Single, and we're the largest in the United States at coffee creamer manufacturing. Uh, single serve coffees that you put like, uh, we can't, we don't call them K-Cups because that's a brand name, but it's the things that you can put within the Keurig and, and have a, a coffee for the day. Tea and syrups, like syrups would be like pancake syrup and stuff. Um, then on the snacks and beverages, single serve drink mixes. So think about it, that's the stuff you know, like Crystal Delight, you open up that single packet, you put in the water and shake it up, and then you're able to have that. Uh, pretzels, snack bars, 
uh, like breakfast bars or energy bars, cold brewed coffee. We manufacture a product that's very similar to a frappuccino or a latte or a mocha. And you see that would compete with Starbucks, right? Uh, chocolates, I mentioned that before in Womelsdorf, Pennsylvania, those are made. Uh, cookies, crackers, pita chips, and broth. Those are just some of the areas of things that we manufacture. So we're in 26 categories across a store. And 17 of those categories were the leader in that particular category. So the difference though is store brands. And so you might know some of these things. So, um, and we're gonna talk about these in just a second. I'll show you some examples. But we make private label food and beverages across North America and Italy for retail grocery food service and industrial customers. Private label represents an opportunity to address and satisfy emerging consumer needs. Simply put, we're the supply chain for our customers' brands. So what happens is, is that for the top 45 retailers across the country, and then some food service people we work with, like a Taco Bell or a Subway, um, we work with these companies, and you can see them right there listed, Kroger, Aldi's, Walmart, Costco, Hannaford, which is Food Lion uh, down south, uh, Ahold, Albertsons, HEB, which is in Texas, Publix, which is in Florida. Oh, Food Line right there, I mentioned that. North Carolina, uh, Wakefern and Wegmans, which is up in the New York area, and you guys might be familiar. Giant Eagle, I think that's in your neck of the woods. So those are all different uh, retailers that we work with, and how do we work with them, okay? So we don't make uh, Oreos, we make an Oreo emulation. So, uh, and in fact, let me back up a little bit. There's really four different levels of private brands and store brands, four different levels. The first level is called the value proposition. That means that it's usually a high margin, low volume, I mean, excuse me, low margin, high volume business in which everyone seems to have it, right? So if you think about it, you can go into a Dollar General store and you're gonna find crackers for a buck and cookies for a dollar. So those are gonna be a little bit lower quality, but still pretty good. I mean, I eat them, but, um, but that's an example called the value proposition. Then you have the next step is called emulation. So again, we don't make Oreos, but we make a cookie like an Oreo. We don't make Cheerios, but we make Tastios like, <laughs> like that. And how they do that is it's fascinating. Food scientists at our company, they reverse engineer what that product is, which means that they get the, the, the branded product and they take it apart and figure out how to manufacture that exactly like that. Now, we can't call it an Oreo, so we have to call it something different. Trader Joe's calls them JoJo's. But if you think about it, it's a very specific cookie for them, but it's very similar to what we manufacture. Walmart, great values products. They call them great values and they have the same product. Sometimes, sometimes these, uh, uh, the retailer will come to us and, and they want something that the uh, brands make. So I'll give you a good example. Re within the last five years or four years, uh, Oreos came out with double stuffs. They wanted double stuffs. They had more filling in the middle. So Walmart comes to us and says, hey, you manufacture our cookies already that are like Oreos, but can we get double stuffs too? And so then we have to figure out how that works. Usually it's a, you have to take a, uh, the machines on the line and do some things with it. And that's an engineering job. And they figure out what the calibration has to be to get that double stuffed in. And then how many cookies go in the tray, which is also a, uh, a packaging and business unit uh, manager thing. So we look and we put it together and next thing you know is we're rolling out double stuffs for Walmart. So that's the second kind is emulation. We don't make the brand, but we make a brand something just like the brand. The third step up is called the destination brand. And you probably know this, there's products that you can only get at Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Costco, you know, there, there's some products you can only get at those places, maybe all these. And so that's called a destination brand. And then finally, the top part of, pre, of private label is called premium product. 
a premium product is one that might cost more, but it's a top of the line thing that they want in their, under their name. Now I can give you a couple examples. I was walking through the store the other day and I saw this snack mix um, at Aldi's and my buddy goes, you know, he goes, that's, that's $12. He goes, I thought the private brands was cheaper. I said, no, that's premium. I mean, we've got high-end cashews in that product. We've got all these, you know, the products, the, the, the ingredients in that product are very expensive. So that's a premium product. We do jellies and jams that are premium. Some of our coffee and teas are premium. We have um, some cookies and crackers that are premium cookies and crackers. So the, we found that the retailers and you guys are the people spending the money will spend a little more money for quality. So premium, destination brands, emulation, and the value proposition. So think about that for a second. Think about the local grocers that you have around your area and their store brands, the ones that have their label on it. You know, I'm guessing we probably have product in your town. So here's a few examples of some of these products. So if you take a look, let's just do from, you know, up with the chocolate chip cookies, Clover Valley. You might know what that is. Clover Valley is Dollar General. So we manufacture, this is just one of many products we have there. Um, and these are all actually from my house. So um, this one is Millville. You can see up here Millville, these cocoa chocolate puffs, which would, you know, cocoa puffs, it competes with that. It's, that's an example of an emulation. We don't make cocoa puffs, but we make these chocolate puffs. And Millville is all these. Over here, you can see down here is a hot buttered flavored syrup. And that says great values. And so that great values is Walmart. And then we have over here, you can see this is the non-dairy creamer one. That's Kroger. And you probably have Kroger's around. Uh, Kroger's a huge manufacturer that owns all different types of smaller retailers across the country. Um, in my area, Kroger's Mariano's. I know that my friend down in South Carolina, I mean, North and South Carolina, they have Harris Teeter. So Kroger's a conglomeration of a lot of uh, smaller retailers. And then over here is one of my favorites, these peanut butter infused uh, pretzels. And these are from Kroger. And that's an example of a premium product because those are selling really, really well right now. And so, you know, we put you, obviously the stores want to put a premium on the, the product because it's selling so well. In fact, when I call that plant, which happens to be in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, by the way, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, I call and I say, Hey, how are you guys doing today? They always go, we're printing money. I go, you're printing money? <laughs> they said, yeah, because these sell so much and you probably ha may have some at your house right now. So a uh, great product line. So that's just a few of hundreds of products that we manufacture across the store. So let me talk just a second about Treehouse Foods core values. Um, and I'll start with a quote, and you know, I mean, probably you're tired of people quoting things too, but, but here's one, this is really true. Find a job that you enjoy doing and you'll never work a day in your life. Uh, Mark Twain said that. I mean, I've seen it, <laughs> I've seen it uh, attributed to quite a few different people, but uh, from what I understand, Mark Twain said that. And before I go through these, I just want you to understand, as you're beginning to start thinking about a career, um, I really want you to think about, you know, what is it that you enjoy doing? I mean, it, and, and the food industry could match a lot of the things that you really enjoy doing. And so that's why, you know, kind of throwing it out there. But not only that, so you choose the industry, then the next step after that is the companies. And it's never too late to start looking at companies that have the same values that you have. And in our case, you know, we have certain core values like people are important to us, you know, meaningful engagement, listening, challenging, supporting, and celebrating. Safety, very important to us at the plants, everywhere. I mean, with COVID right now, it's been a major part of us to have people safety, actually all four of these people and safety on the very front end. At our plants right now, we have created and devised all types of safety precautions to make sure people feel better, feel are, are feeling, I mean, feel well when they come to work, 
have extra time off and they're getting paid uh, substantially well when they get sick and also just having all kinds of things to help keep the next one quality of food safe. So that's an important aspect because we have to make sure that people come to work and leave work in the same condition. And number two is we have to make sure that the food quality is of the highest quality and the best that we can manufacture um, at that time. So that's one of the things that we take pride in. And then finally, service. You know, our customers are the ones who pay our bills, so we have to make sure that they're happy. And when we talk about customers, again, we're talking uh, not necessarily about you as the end user, that's important too, but we're talking about the big retailers, the big food service manufacturers, and we help them service you as the consumer. So it's really important that we're making quality product that's affordable and is great so that you come back and can want to get it over and over again. Um, and it says good old fashioned customer service has not gone out of style, not one bit. So we look at on time and in full uh, at the tables and customers uh, also expect value. But the bigger, deeper part of this particular PowerPoint slide is this for you. If you get nothing else out of this particular slide, just get that you really have to have a, work for a company that has the same values, work ethic, appreciates your work-life balance, um, is going to do things and help promote your career in a way that you uh, are gonna be happy. And then you'll have that quote from Mark Twain, you'll never really quote unquote work a day in your life. I've been at this company for 12 years and I feel like some days I've put in a lot, a lot of hours, but at the end of the day, I love it. It's great, it's great work. So let's just talk about careers within the food industry. I mean, I can be a little selfish and I could talk about Treehouse Foods, but at, right now is the time for you to start thinking about what exactly do I want to do? The food industry, again, I said is a, you know, it's something that is really unique to the United States in that our man, we keep most of our plants here in the United States when it comes to food manufacturing. Um, and what are some of the opportunities? So I'm just going to walk through each one of these briefly and just make sure that you understand what we're looking at. So operations and engineering. So in operations and engineering, we're talking about what keeps the machines running. What keeps the plant humming? Um, and that's everything from an educated, uh, degreed engineer that might be doing design work. It could be an IT person who runs all of the IT uh, programs. Every line is automated and robotics are becoming even more important across the board within plants. And then you've got the operations aspects of things because there's people that sometimes just have electron, uh, electrician certifications mechanic certifications, maybe, you know, things like that. But all of those are, thing, if you're somebody that's mechanically inclined, I'm gonna tell you, the food industry needs you. In fact, manufacturing across America right now is having a huge problem filling jobs in uh, engineering and um, in uh, electrical and all of just the aspects of that. We're having a tough time. If you go into this field, this very first field, you're almost guaranteed a job. The second thing is manufacturing. So, you know, just getting involved in how plants operate. So you could go to you could go to college, or you could just begin working at a plant and work your way up to where you're supervising and managing whole groups of people within a plant that are manufacturing and doing the best of possible work. Safety to the people, safety for the food, high quality. So manufacturing jobs can run the gamut. They can run from everywhere from hourly production workers who might be everything from packing boxes to um, making sure labeling machines are working to uh, just doing quality control across the plant to forklift drivers at a warehouse. But then you can move up into those roles to become team leads and production managers. And a team lead and a production manager are super key because you're the over a team, to make sure that that schedule and the amount of food that has to be manufactured at that time gets completed. Manufacturing also is multiple shifts. So first, second, third shift, some places have off shifts. Uh, some plants run 24 seven. They never shut down. 
Um, there's also, some, except for, uh, for cleaning, you'd be really surprised, and we'll talk about that in a little bit here, about how much sanitation takes place in plants, especially right now with COVID. I mean, sometimes whole lines get shut down and then they just get totally sanitized, um, not just on a regular basis, which they have to do schedule wise, but also because of uh, the current COVID situation. Food science, somebody might say, food science, what's that? Hey, there, you might like to cook. You might be somebody that says, hey, I am great at culinary. Well, you know what? There could be a career in food science for you. Food science not only is taking like a cookie and breaking it down and figuring out how to make it and how to make a better cookie using different ingredients. Food science is also people that could be developing new products. Um, I think about a few areas that I've seen grow over the years. One is nutritional products and protein drinks and things like that. That's all developed from food scientists. And if you're somebody, again, that likes to cook and you're the culinary part, maybe the food uh, science part could be for food service. So you could be working with you know, uh, a company like a uh, Subway or a McDonald's on some new product that's coming up. I mean, every major food manufacturing company in the United States has food scientists working for them. Quality, quality is key. I mean, the quality people are the people that keep us safe. The quality are the people that make sure that everything that's coming off the line is right. Everything from the way that the package is sealed to what's inside doesn't have any contaminants. I mean, you know, there's all different things that can happen within a plant with contaminants. So they have to make sure, and they're doing, they're doing testing all the time to make sure that the quality of the product's fine. Supply chain. Supply chain is really big. So... We're talking about every single thing from forecasting how much product needs to be made at the plant to how the transportation of these of the product goes across the country to um, overall customer service and how that gets handled within the customer. So making how, if you're somebody that loves the puzzles, I would say puzzles are great, or somebody that really can um, is process oriented, puzzles and process oriented, supply chain could be a great job for you. I mean, just figuring out how do we get things moved around within an organization or within a company or within a country. And that can also supply chain for some country, uh, companies, not necessarily ours, but for some food companies, that could include overseas things too, right? I mean, because we do send some products to Australia, China, uh, Africa, and uh, Asia, uh, South America. Marketing. Uh, marketing is two things. It could be the creative side, which is like the advertising and the cool specs and what the package looks like, like on those pictures I showed you before. But marketing can also be where is going to be the next cool product and how do I figure out what is going to sell and what and how do if we have a product, how do we get it to sell in the market? You know, it's marketing is also about figuring out the supply and demand needs for a product. I mean, sometimes products go out there, and you know this, you've seen it, where they're duds, and, and the word gets out pretty quick that, man, that product stinks, nobody, and nobody buys it. Well, the marketing people hate to hear that stuff, because that means they made a mistake and misread the market. Other times, things boom like crazy. So I'll give you one quick example on a marketing that, of something that boomed we didn't expect. So we have a product that is very similar to Eggo waffles. Um, it's it's almost exactly like an Eggo waffle, but, and you just buy it, it's the store brand version of it. And all of a sudden, about three years ago, it just started selling like crazy. I mean, we were like, what in the world? These frozen waffles are selling like crazy. We asked our marketing people, they didn't know. We asked other people, no one could figure it out. Ah, there was a little show on Netflix, some of you might've seen, where one of the characters, uh, Stranger Things is the show, and one of the characters named Eleven ate Eggo waffles, started loving Eggo waffles. Well, guess what? Our product was just as good as Eggo waffles, and if they didn't have Eggo waffles, then they would buy our product, and sometimes people would buy it, and you wouldn't know the difference. But those products spiked simply because it was on this new popular TV show. So marketing is a really cool and powerful part of all food company and food manufacturing. Then finance, hey, maybe you're a finance, you're a numbers person. Well, I'm gonna tell you something. Finance could be the thing for you. You're somebody that loves to figure out how things make money and how to keep costs down in making money. 
finance could be the world for you. So that's a lot of a lot of areas of finance within the food industry. And then finally, commercial sales. Yeah, obviously you got to have somebody that goes and sells the product to the store, right? So those, if you're somebody that likes to be out, that you're outgoing, you're organized, and you like to put together projects um, and listen, not talk as much as you listen, and then figure things out and help that customer be successful. Commercial sales. Just to let you know, I put Treehouse Foods has these opportunities, but I'm going to tell you all the food industry has these roles. Okay, so let's talk a little bit, uh, another thing too. I just want to back uh, uh, point out one thing about career opportunities. And I put this down for hourly roles. You know, college isn't for everybody. I get that. You know, there are meaningful careers at Treehouse and also at other companies at, pl at, at plants. You know, hourly workers that perform food quality tasks, warehouse work, management, electricians, maintenance, sanitation roles. And when I say sanitation, I'm talking about going in and cleaning the machines, not the, not the bathrooms, right? So we're talking sanitation of after each shift, the, the machines have to be cleaned thoroughly so that the next uh, batch of product can be made. And those are all important in keeping food safe and they can offer longevity. Um, I think we just gave an award at one of our plants in Ogden, Utah, that makes Loft House cookies, which are a wonderful product that you can get inside your bakery uh, at any of your stores. I think she was celebrating 44 years. Fantastic. She started out in one position and now she was managing a, a, a whole group of people uh, over the course of her career. And she just really, really enjoyed it. Now, there's also professional and salaried roles, as we talked about. and you know, when you're thinking about majors and what you want to do, you know, think about the college and university. But one thing that's also important, and I, I know that some of you are going to be going to college, you really need to start thinking about this now. Meaningful internships will get you hired. I have interviewed multiple people that did not do any internship. And if I'm weighing them against a person who did a good internship, they're really at a disadvantage. This is the second link that I talked about, this link on our career site. If you go out to our career site and click on it, we have an internship link that will talk a little bit about what that internship will be. All of these things that I showed here, you can do internships in any of those categories. And so one of the things is you're choosing colleges as you're starting to go to college, or you're choosing, or you already chose a college and you're trying to think of classes to take, you want to think about what that internship would look like. And it's also, it's very important you asked about that if you didn't already about internships at your university. If you're already dedicated to a, uh, to a university, you're already enrolled and everything's ready, I would start talking to them right now about internships. You, you can start your doing little things your sophomore and junior year. And so you're not all of a sudden caught your senior year going, oh, I didn't do an internship. That does happen, let me tell you. And those people, I mean, I've never in my life was so surprised by seeing uh, college kids about to graduate. They were asking me about internships, and I said, yeah, but you're graduating in May. So take that seriously and really, really be thinking about that if you're going to go to, into college. Um, on the flip side, the hourly roles can have that too. So electricians, maintenance, some of those roles, when you're trying to get those certifications that are necessary for those, they may have a work program too. And contacting a plant or asking your uh, the the place that you're going to school at, uh, maybe the trade school, if they've got some kind of program that can put, you know, job placement program would be helpful. But um, hands-on is always going to be an advantage for you in any field you're in, especially in this field. I can tell you. So what are the expectations of the hiring and how does the process work? Um, just briefly, you know, what we do is our hourly minimum are we need a high school diploma or a GED. Um, any specialized certification, so as I mentioned, like electricians, a mechanic or a forklift driver, they have to have certain certifications to have those. Um, you have to be able to pass the physical, bending, lifting, crouching, there's different kind of things. Uh, working in a plant's physical. It just is. Um, there's not too many jobs where you're standing around looking. <laughs> In fact, I don't know if I know any. But um, so hourly roles, that, that's the minimum. Salaried, 
college degrees are required for most roles. Um, some roles will take the equivalent of work experience, but we're seeing that less and less. We kind of have to look and see what the role is. If it's something that's going to be in finance or marketing, my guess is they're probably going to want the degree is going to require the degree and maybe even an MBA. So just something to think about. And then also, again, I mentioned this relative intern experience is or similar work during college is highly preferred. I mean, there are some universities that are fantastic at this and others that aren't. But you may have to try to figure out some way if you don't have a good internship program at your college or university of how to gain some of this experience. And a few suggestions could be made by talking to professors or just going around and trying to look up and talk to HR people at uh, factories, uh, offices, companies in your location. So final note is this, and I'm just going to leave it for what it is. All roles require passing a background check and drug screen. Felony convictions and misdemeanors are looked at from a state and county level, and they can be knockout factors depending on what they were. So just an example would be of DUI. You want to be very, very cautious and stay away from those type of situations. Forklift driver does not match with DUI. Can't do it, right? So uh, there is a, there's a limitation on some of these things, but for the most part, it's it's looked at pretty seriously. The other one is positive drug screens are an immediate do not hire scenario. So even though we have, I don't think Pennsylvania is one of these states, there are states where now they're legalizing cannabis. The big thing though is that, you know, most place states, or excuse me, most plants, most companies are going to ask for either a urine test or a hair follicle test. Now, that makes sense, right? I mean, you're working in a plant with high speed equipment or you're working in an office where you're making multi-million dollar decisions you don't want to be high so i mean and they don't want you to be so i mean that's the thing is is the number one's your safety and number two is for the company's safety so just something for you to uh remember so food is fun i mean i'll tell you i've loved working in the food industry so um and that's kind of my problem is i've been eating too much this is actually not me, I think you guys recognize that actor, but uh, you know, that's how I am in every store. I go, oh, I'm just running in to get one thing. Next thing you know is I'm juggling uh, 90 things in my hand, and I'm sure you've been through that situation as well. And then just a few quotes, uh, just for inspiration here in these days of COVID and being locked in and, and not being able to finish school the way you wanted to and a lot of other things. The world is changing, but just a few of these, I, and I, I just want to go through them quickly. It's your attitude, not your aptitude, that will determine your altitude. It's one of my all-time favorite quotes from Zig Ziglar. How you look and attack every situation every day is going to be so much better than how, you know, than how good you are at stuff. And that's going to determine your altitude. And the movie I think about all the time is that old movie, Rudy, because that's kind of what happened with that guy. Uh, here's another one. Don't worry about the world coming to an end today. It's already tomorrow in Australia. Don't sweat the small stuff. You know, you, it looks like, you know, everything looks like doom and gloom right now, but guess what? Tomorrow's a brighter day. The next one, I've learned it's important not to limit yourself. You can do whatever you really love to do, no matter what it is. And that's Ryan Gosling, who was in Deadpool and a whole bunch of other great movies. Um, that's what he had to say. I'd be amiss if I didn't quote Michael Jordan being from Chicago, right? So um, he said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost more than 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. And then finally, uh, <laughs> for those of you that still don't know what to do with your life, Here's a little funny quote for you just to kind of hopefully make you chuckle and, and hopefully you got some ideas here today. You know, doing nothing is very doing nothing is very hard to do. You never really know when you're finished. And that's a, a funny comedian that I like, a Leslie Nielsen. So I'm going to open it up now for questions. Uh, I know that was a lot of information I threw at you right there. And 
So I don't, not sure exactly how this is going to be handled, but uh, Annalisa, are you, are you taking back over? Um, yeah, I can. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I do not see any questions right now, so we'll give people a chance to type those up if they have them. Um, just in the chat. Can I exit the screen? What was that? Oh, I'll just leave this up, and you, if you see any, you can ask me. Um, and, and also, I mean, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I talked mostly about tree, you know, treehouse, but I wanted to make sure that it's understood that the food and the food industry in general uh, has needs. And so there's a, and there's a lot of excellent companies in our com in our country that when it comes to the food industry. Great, thank you. Yeah, I personally don't know much about the food industry, so that was great information. Um, I still don't see any coming through. We'll give it another minute or so. I mean, one last thing is if anybody has had jobs through college like I did, I mean, I had a friend that worked at McDonald's, um, and now he actually ended up uh, working for McDonald's corporate here in Chicago. I mean, he got to know how things went as a franchise. He got to learn how that business was run, and he wanted to go to the, the other side. Uh, some people, I was a waiter at a, at a, I'm not a waiter, I was a bus boy at a restaurant when I was in high school. And I learned a lot about how the food comes in from these major food distributors like Cisco, and then how they have to keep inventory and rotate that food uh, in order to make sure the people are getting the top quality and the newest stuff. And all of that stuff that I learned and my friend learned was useful as in my career as I advanced. Uh, that's one thing. And the second point I think I'd just like to make is that don't be afraid to make mistakes. You know, you, you might go into a career and go, God, I hate this. You know, I mean, maybe, you know, you go into accounting and all of a sudden you say, wow, this is not very exciting and not really what I thought it would be. Well, guess what? You've got time to change. I mean, nothing, you're, the one great thing about, I think, where the, the, how the world is structured today is that you if you get a broad you know you want to have a you want to have a good focus on a specific subject matter but you also have to learn how you can apply that across multiple disciplines so those kind of things can be very helpful there great yeah we had a few questions coming through um, the first one is how much experience do you need to apply well, it depends on the role, okay, right? So, I mean, we have entry-level positions for people right out of college, or if someone's graduating high school and they want to go work, I mean, if you're healthy and you're fit and you pass the physical, boom, you can get a job at any plant, right? Um, you know, if they, but then if you want specific positions, like you want, you know, I want to be a forklift uh, operator um, at, or electrician at this plant, or this DC, which means distribution center, then you have to make sure that you have those cert specific certifications. And the other question here is, what is the best way to apply? Okay, great. The best way to apply to a position uh, pretty much from any company is gonna be going to their website and taking a look and see what's open there. Um, that's number one. Now, looking for that, that's the number one way that everybody does. but I'm going to tell you, I'll give you a little bit recruiting advice coming from as a recruiter. So, and jobs hunting advice. Most people, probably 70% of hires come from referrals. So if you know someone at that company or you get to know somebody at a plant, whether our plant or somewhere else, that is the best way. Now, you might say, I don't know anybody there. Well, there's a lot of different tools out there now with social media, right? So the big one is LinkedIn. So if you go into LinkedIn, you can look up and target companies and search people from companies and try to get connected with them. And once you get connected on LinkedIn with people at that company, you can ask them, you know, and, and start to build up a relationship in which then suddenly you're their referral because they, kind of they've connected with you on LinkedIn and your background looks good, right? So that, that, that might take a lot more experience. If you're looking for more of an hourly job, applying online is the best way, but this, but, or another thing I've seen people do, it's a little old school, it's a little old fashioned, but it's um, 
showing up at the place and just dropping off your resume. Asking if they have any job openings. You know, um, nothing is nothing sells yourself better than yourself. And showing up and having a look um, is always better than somebody just looking at a piece of paper, right? Because I can't tell who you are from a piece of paper. I can only judge you of whether you have the qualification. But seeing you, I'm going to, you know, is going to be good. Number two is getting referred is going to even be better. So hope that answers that. Those are great tips. Thank you for that. Um, I don't see any other questions, so we'll start to wrap up here. And if any others come through, I'll let you know. Um, okay. So well, let me just say last thing then. Last thing I said, you guys go out to your stores and buy the store brands. The store brands, you know, I, I am big on a couple brands. There's some brands that I won't, you know, I, I have some brands I have to have. But if you don't care about the cookie cracker uh, cereal, uh, different things that you're eating, feel free, try out some of the store brands because number one is you're helping that community store because they're making more money off that particular product. But number two is you'd be helping our company too. <laughs> That's a great plug for Treehouse. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today, Jonathan. We really appreciate it. Um, just want to say our next session will be next Thursday, June 18th at 11 a.m., we will be having a representative from Red Lion Controls with us. Um, information for accessing that session is going to be distributed by our team shortly, so keep a lookout for that. Um, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, or if you'd like more information about services available to you, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and I don't see any other questions coming through, so I think that's all we have. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And Jonathan, thank you again for your wonderful presentation. All right, thank you. And do you need a copy of that, Anlisa? Or do, is everything uh, recorded? Everything's been recorded, so that's great. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Hey, enjoy. Have a wonderful weekend and be safe out there. Thank you. You as well.